It's time for your favorite show of the week and mine, Twitter Tuesday. All three segments coming up here on Locked On Balls. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey everybody, welcome into this edition of Locked On Balls, your team every single day. I'm your host, Eric Kane. Of course, we're talking about the UT Volunteers every single day here on Locked On Balls. Thanks so much for making Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Five days a week, every single morning when you wake up, it is your go to Tennessee Volunteers podcast. All right, we got Twitter Tuesday, a whole lot coming up here today. If you're new to the show, I'm Eric Kane. I do radio at 991 The Sports Animal in Knoxville, Tennessee. That's the flagship station for the University of Tennessee. I write for the rival site covering Tennessee. That's fallquest.com. And of course, I'm your host of Locked On Balls. Welcome to it. Pull up a chair, stay for a while. Appreciate you guys. And let's get down into it. Twitter Tuesday. We'll start with David. Twitter Tuesday again. It's when you take over the show. David says, what is Jeremy Banks' ceiling? All SEC, average starter, question mark. Well, I think it's no secret. A lot of you guys know that I have... uh, I've been very hard on Jeremy Banks throughout his uh, tenure in Tennessee, and I think deservingly so in a lot of areas. But, I mean, I call it like I see it. He improved a, a, a crap ton last year, right? And outside of Byron Young, he is probably Tennessee's best player defensively. He's probably Tennessee's most important player uh, defensively, although Byron Young's probably the best player defensively, if that makes sense. I think both can be true. I think Banks' ceiling is an all-SEC player now. He'll have the stats for it. I mean, he was, I think he was like number eight in the nation last year in tackles, uh, but he was not all SEC. Um, you know, he's going to have to be a smarter player. I think that he has another level to get to in terms of being a better linebacker. Still just learning the position. I say it all the time, running underneath blocks instead of over the top, uh, picking sides instead of going straight through and, you know, taking on the blocker, uh, stuff like that. You know, his pass coverage is is not very good. Um, he makes stupid plays after the whistle, all that type of stuff. But there's no doubt about it. Jeremy Banks is a player, and uh, he was a big part of Tennessee's success last year on defense. This is ex- the success that that unit did have. So I would say the ceiling for Jeremy Banks would definitely be an all-conference player. Um, he's going to rack up the tackles, and uh, there's no doubt about that. We'll move on to uh, Tim. Tim wants to know, obviously we have a big head as fans for being a consensus number one, unanimous number one in baseball. So how do we keep the team from getting a big head? Or in short form, how does Vitello and the guys handle this? Well, no doubt about it. I don't think that anybody on that team is going to get the big head because you're right number one. Now, they play with confidence. They're cocky. That's part of the mantra of the team. That's part of the Tony Vitello uh, realm. That's part of every team he's been uh, you know, the head coach for. But they always play like they have a chip on their shoulder. And I don't think that's going to change whatsoever. I know Tony Vitello is not going to you know, lighten up at all just because the team – is number one. I mean, you're just through two SEC weekends. You have a long way to go. You're going to Vanderbilt this weekend. Yes, South Carolina took two or three from Vanderbilt, but uh, there's still a lot of SEC baseball to play, trust me. So I think the team will handle it well. I don't think anything's going to change. They're always going to play with that chippiness. They're always going to play like they have something to prove. That's just kind of um, that's kind of what Tony Vitello is all about. So, you know, as fans, have fun because this is a good team to uh, to support and a good team to watch. The team, I think, will take care of business and won't let that get to them. All right, we've got Preston here, and Preston's got a couple questions here. Uh, First and foremost, he wants to know, is there anyone that may potentially be moved around? If not now, at what point in the offseason would a decision like this be made? Not talking about lineman movement like what we're seeing right now with the tackles, but a wide receiver going to quarterback, a quarterback going to tight end. With Hendon Hooker being a lock at quarterback and Jackson coming in as a freshman, could we expect Joe Milton to make some type of transition to another position, or does that seem too absurd to you? All right, I'll answer that one first, and then Preston's got another one. Um, Yeah, Joe Milton's not going to move to another position. He's a quarterback. He's not going to play tight end. He's not going to play defensive end. He's not going to play linebacker or anything like that, just because he's a big guy. I'm not saying you're saying this, Preston, but just because – uh. Just because he's a big guy doesn't mean that he can play. He can line up on the line of scrimmage and rush the passer. He is a quarterback. You want him to be a quarterback because, you know, Hendon Hooker is, you know, he's durable, all things considered, right? But he's going to miss some plays, hopefully not many. But with the way that Tennessee runs him, he's going to get banged up a little bit. Keep in mind, he missed some time against Ole Miss. He missed some time against Florida. He missed some time in a couple of other games for a little bit. You want an experienced veteran presence to come in there and be able to, 
you know, pick up, you know, right where you left off. Now, if Tayden Jackson proves that he can be that guy and can step in and he's the best option, by all means, let it be Tayden Jackson in 2022. Right now, that's not the case, and that's okay. He's brand new. Um, but right now, Joe Milton has a lot of starts under his belt. He's not made the most of them, no doubt about it, but he's the guy that I would want coming in. Gosh, you know what I thought of earlier? I thought of that old Miss ending when he ran out of bounds. Oh, my God, how pathetic was that? It's I still remember it. We all still remember it, but he is the guy that without a doubt you want to come in if something happened to Hendon Hooker right now. So Joe Milton, though, um, as far as some others, Lenny's Whitehead has always been rumored to move the linebacker. Gosh, if it hasn't happened by now, it's not going to happen. Uh, they want four backs that they can count on because, quite frankly, they had to use four backs at points in times last year. Right now, you got Jabari Small, you got Jalen Wright, you got Justin Williams-Thomas, you got Lenny's Whitehead. That's four. You'll have one more running back coming in and Dylan Sampson. But Lenith Whitehead looks like he's going to be a running back to stay for the long haul unless something happens. Again, if he was going to move to a linebacker, I think it would have happened by now. Um, the only other one that I could see right now potentially happening in the future, Jimmy Holiday. He's been rumored to go play quarterback. He's been rumored to go to the defensive backfield for quite some time. And again, it's kind of like if it hasn't happened yet, you know, what are you waiting on? Jimmy Holiday, yes, Tennessee needs two wide receivers, and he's looked pretty sharp playing the outside of wide receivers so far this spring. Maybe he's staying there because Tennessee wants to see if he can do anything, if he can prove anything, and you know, whenever you know, step up and fill one of the two voids, right? But with the depletion of the quarterback position for this spring, it would be the perfect time for Jimmy Holiday to move from wide receiver to cornerback. That has not happened. I don't know if that's going to happen. It hasn't happened yet, but that is something that I would pay attention to. Um, for stuff like that to happen, you want to do it in spring so they can experiment with it. Um, but a lot of times you might just have to move it sometime in the offseason to go into camp. With a clean slate, we'll have to see. But uh, right now, that's all I uh, that, that's all I got for you. Uh, last one for Preston. What's up with Aaron Willis? I know you touched on this a while back, but does the staff not believe he can be a viable option at linebacker? Another position we're bleeding at. I know he's been undersized, but from some of the footage I've saw, I've seen from his high school, he seems like he would be a great option. He is someone I've been wanting to see since he came to UT's campus. Uh, maybe that's wishful thinking on my part. Preston, you and me both, man, um, back in the class of 2021, he was one of the prospects that I was most excited about. I really was. The last staff loved them some Aaron Willis. This staff is not as high on Aaron Willis. Point blank, you mentioned the size factor. Um, he weighs a little over 200 pounds. He or maybe just 200 pounds soaking wet. He, he is not a big guy. You can't play linebacker in the Southeastern Conference weighing 200 pounds. You just can't. Um, he's not very tall. Solon Page isn't a big guy, but he's a tall guy. He, he's got a little bit more weight on him. Um, Aaron Beasley is is a bigger guy, even though he's he, he's a skinny frame, but he's a bigger guy. Aaron Willis is small, man. Um, you can't play in this league. So I think strength and conditioning is going to be huge for him. He doesn't look much bigger right now. That doesn't mean to say that he's not. Um, you need a full off-season uh, regimen. So hopefully by the time fall comes, he can be a guy that at least you feel decent about. But right now, he's a, I would say he's at least third string in the pecking order. But we'll see. His high school tape is really, really good. But I will say this. The last staff was a lot higher on Aaron Willis than this staff is. Doesn't mean that that's the end result for him. We'll have to see. But right now, uh, he was still down in uh, the pecking order. We will go to uh, Braden next. Braden wants to know, what can we expect uh, life to look like after Hendon Hooker? Words, Eric Reed. Uh, will there be a quarterback battle between Taven Jackson and Nico? Would you rather see Nico wait to start or get the keys to the offense from the jump? Yeah, good question, Brayden. I think in the perfect world, you would like for your experienced veteran quarterback, Joe Milton, to be ready to go. Joe Milton would be exhausting his last year of eligibility at that time, taking advantage of the COVID year. We'll have to see if that's something he even wants to do. But he would have another year of eligibility remaining. You would like for Joe Milton to be ready to roll and take the keys of this offense. Having said that, Taven Jackson will be here for his second year. How much is he grasped? You know, being a sponge behind Hidden Hooker for a year, is he ready physically and is he ready mentally to step up and take the keys of this offense? And then if it's not Taven Jackson, let's see what Nico's got, right? I mean, he'll be he will be an early enrollee this time next year, so he'll have a spring practice under his belt. How does he look? How much weight has he added? Is he ready to go from a mental standpoint of running this office or not? I would fully expect there to be a full-fledged quarterback competition, but if Joe Milton's still on the roster, he's option one probably until he's flat-out beaten for that roster spot. I wouldn't count out Taven Jackson because he'll already have a year-and-a-half leg up on him, and then I wouldn't count out Nico because of the talents. 
personally, for me, I would not want to rush Nico into starting day one. I just not my style. However, if he's the best option, then what? Without a doubt, he's he's got the best skill set. He he will have the best skill set of anybody on roster at that point in time. All right, Twitter Tuesday. We're off and running. We'll come back with some more Twitter Tuesdays in segment two here in just a moment on Locked On Balls. Anyone take St. Peter's? And how about your brackets being busted? Am I right? Yeah, mine's not looking good as we're in the stage of the Final Four, but I still got some cash from my Stat Hero Pick'ems. If you haven't checked out this new platform, you're really missing out. Stat Hero's NCAA single game Pick'ems pits the star players against one another in amazing hybrid fantasy between sports gambling. Take control back from those handicappers that always seem to have the advantage. Start focusing on the players that you know the best of the gameplay that doesn't try to rely on big spreads, long odds, or those funky props. In addition to pickums, they also have dozens of lineups that you can comb through in the head-to-head matchups that simply post the sets of players for you to take on with the sets of players that you know the best. Stat Hero is the easiest and fastest way to get your sports action fix. The simple, sleek gameplay that you'll be playing on in minutes. This is what Daily Fantasy was meant to be. So right now, go to stathero.com slash locked on. Use that promo code locked on for a 100% deposit match. That's stathero.com slash locked on. Use promo code locked on. For 100% match, that's stathero.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions do apply. We're back and rolling here on a Twitter Tuesday edition of Locked on Balls. Your first listen each and every day at Locked on Balls on Twitter and at underscore Kaner. I am your host, Eric Kane. Let's get back into it. This is Cody. A couple of Twitter Tuesday questions. What's basketball's biggest need for next year? Is there a certain position that we need to fix via the transfer portal? Or do we just need to develop the players on the current roster? Also, if you're willing, well, I'll hold on to that here for just a second uh, and answer your question, Cody. I'm definitely willing to talk baseball. Um, Yeah, so I would say Tennessee needs to go and find a big man in the transfer portal. I truly do. Go look at what Auburn did with Walker Kessler. Go look at uh, some of these other teams around the conference, Kentucky with Oscar Sheboy. I'm not talking maybe as a big a splash like that, but hey, you'll take it, right? Tennessee needs consistent uh, scoring in the front court. Has not had it for three years from John Fulkerson, you know, dating back to 2019, second half of that SEC schedule. Has not had it yet with Brandon Huntley Hatfield. Jonas Adu, I do not believe that's going to be his game. Uros Plavsis, that's not really his game. Tennessee needs consistent scoring in the front court. So if you can go add a big man to replace Fulkerson in the front court that is a scoring first option, go get him. Well, outside of that, you're going to lose Kennedy Chandler, which is going to be a big blow, but you have Zakai Ziegler, you'll bring in B.J. Edwards. I still think Josiah Jordan James and Santiago Vescovi, of course, will go and test the NBA waters. I still expect them back, but of course, that's nothing guaranteed. So the transfer portal is very lucrative. Um, that you know, uh, John Calipari has changed the way that he does basketball here in the last couple of years. He, instead of going the ones and dones, he's going via the transfer portal, and you're seeing a little bit of success. Of course, they got out in the second round this year, but you know what I'm saying. Excuse me, the first round this year, but you know what I'm saying. So Transfer portal will be lucrative. I would go find a scoring big man via the portal if it was up to me. All right, last one uh, for Cody. Also, if you're willing to do Major League Baseball, who has the bigger impact for their new team? Is it Freddie Freeman or Matt Olson? Good question. All right, so I think Freddie Freeman's going to be a stud. Oh, my gosh, hitting hitting anywhere from second, second or third probably in that lineup for the Dodgers. Man, he is going to be, he's going to be awesome. He's going to have a huge, huge season in my opinion. However, I think the biggest impact will be Matt Olson to the Braves. Call me a homer. Call me Atlanta Braves homer, whatever you want to do it. But I think when you're replacing that type of production, hitting in the middle of that order for an Atlanta team that sure has some star power, don't get me wrong. Duval is returning. Acuna will be back in that lineup. You've got Albies. Uh, you've got a lot of, you know, you got Austin Riley. You've got some bats in there, okay? I, I'm not saying Atlanta's depleted, but there are more all-star worthy bats in that lineup for Los Angeles than there are for Atlanta. Plus, I think, not by much. I'm not saying Freddie Freeman's a bad defender because he is not a bad defender. Matt Olson's a better defender. So the bigger impact on their new team, I say it'll be Matt Olson for the Atlanta Braves. But Freddie Freeman's going to be a stud, especially playing for the LA Dodgers. So, Cody, I appreciate that uh, from you. We'll go on to K Wayne 1800. Twitter Tuesday. What happens first? Tennessee makes it to the Final Four in basketball or the Vols make it to the SEC championship game in football? All right. So. <clears throat> excuse me, that is a good question. Um, I would have to say Tennessee makes it to the SEC championship game in football. Not that this team and program is not in the right direction. You guys know my thoughts on Barnes. You guys know I've got a mini-minute rant saying, you know, you'll have a chance to 
to compete for a national championship each and every year with Rick Barnes. I, I fully believe that. But it is so hard. It is so freaking hard to get to the Final Four. Look at this year's tournaments. You had a one seed in Baylor get knocked down the round of 32. You had uh, Kansas is the only one seed that that has advanced on to the Final Four. You, I mean, you had Gonzaga get knocked out in the Sweet 16 by Arkansas. You've had, um, gosh, what were the other uh, one seeds that you know, Arizona get knocked out in the, in the in the Elite Eight? So I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's really really tough. Look at Kentucky got knocked out in the first round. Tennessee got knocked out in the second round. It is it is challenging to make it through that gauntlet stretch of an of an NCAA tournament. For Tennessee, I mean, look at it this year, right? I'm not saying it's going to be a cakewalk because Tennessee's got to take some steps. Kentucky's going to be a challenge. Um, South Carolina might be a whole lot better than what it's been. Florida's down. Georgia can only do one thing but go down. You just got to beat out a couple of the teams to get an opportunity to go play in Atlanta for an SEC championship. And I don't think Tennessee is too far off from making that a reality. Maybe not in 2022, but it's getting closer. It's it's a lot closer now than it has been in quite some time. So I would say an appearance in the SEC championship game for uh, Tennessee football. Uh, we will roll on now to the Locked On Vols direct messages as I pull out my phone. Tab dancing here, tab dancing. And we'll go to Bruce. I'm very proud of our basketball teams, men and women both. I would like to add my question. To get the big stars like Alabama and, and Georgia of the world, what is the dollar value that you're going to have to throw out there for that type of talent? Is there a form uh, a formality for like how much a good linebacker will cost, et cetera? What is the dollar values? Bruce, that's a good question, man. Um, I know some things. I don't know a lot of things. I, I really, really don't. This is all new. Um, I don't think you're going to have to go and pay for every single recruit. I don't think you're going to have to go pay for every single blue chipper, but a lot of times you will. A lot of the times it's it, you know it's going to be a bidding war. It, it simply will be. I mean that's and it's legal with name, image, and likeness. It, it truly is, and so it's not a bad thing. You got to embrace it, and a lot of teams around the country are embracing it. Can't be used for inducement, of course. Um, but when you go about it the right way, that's what it's going to turn into. So to answer your question, I don't have a dollar value per se, um, and it's going to vary on every student athlete because some student athletes are not going to value that as much as the others. Some will to an extent others is what it's all going to be about so it's going to vary i don't have a blueprint for you for that i do apologize but i know that um it will vary and it's going to be a part i mean it's it's, it's going to be a part of it moving forward the no ifs ands and buts about it uh blah wants to chime in what is your favorite play from the 2021 football season um keep in mind i'm a football nerd <clears throat> excuse me so you know, you might not remember some of these plays. Some of these plays might not have stood out to you. There was one play against Pittsburgh when uh, Jacob Warren lined up in the H-back role uh, right behind kind of the guard. They split the guard and the, and, the, and the tackle about two and a half yards off the, the ball of the line of scrimmage. And he kind of just ran a little banana route, a little peel route through that gap on up behind the linebacker, and they threw it to him, and uh, it was a touchdown. I love, love, love that that uh, that route concept and that, uh, that, that dr uh, play design from Josh Heupel. Another one. I love the screens out to Valus Jones and Javante Payton. Why? Because Princeton fan would get his big butt out there and block in the perimeter, and he was so good at it. The other wide receiver would block, and they were so good at it. And you would you would just make a veer lane for either Valus or Javante Payton to run through. Tennessee scored like that against Kentucky twice. Tennessee scored like that against a couple of other teams a couple of times because both Javante Payton and Valus Jones are very, very fast. But it only works – because of sharp perimeter blocking and because Princeton fan can get out there and be the kick man and, and kind of wash him down. So uh, those are two play designs that I really, really enjoyed from Tennessee football. I'm a nerd. You know, that's not a, that's not a very, I mean, it's big plays. Both were touchdowns, but uh, it, it's not necessarily maybe the plays, the, the play types that y'all were thinking of. Uh, lastly here for this segment, we will go to the Facebook page. You guys can follow my Facebook page um, on at Caner on air as well. And you guys can check out, um, all the content there. That's where Eric chimes in for Twitter Tuesday each and every week. Um, are there any of the following a uh, Tennessee lean? Okay, he lists a, a couple of different prospects. Uh, Cornell Tate. Um, I, gosh, I don't know. I, I don't know if we'd say Tennessee lean on these, but Tennessee's so up there for Cornell Tate, the IMG wide receiver. Kyler Casper, the Arizona from, or the, excuse me, the wide receiver from Arizona. Um, Devin Hyatt is is a guy, but I think he, in my opinion, my opinion would be down in the pecking order compared to Casper and Carnell Tate for sure. Um, Bryson Sanders, I think, is an offensive lineman that he was really feeling Tennessee. I think Tennessee was really, really feeling him. But 
uh, Bryson Sanders from Baylor School down in Chattanooga area. He has gone on to some official visits here, or to, to visiting, not official, but some visits here lately to LSU. He was in Oklahoma this past weekend. Um, I think it's going to be imperative to get him back on campus. I believe he will be back on campus for April the 9th. I'll have to double check on that. Um, I'm not going to say Tennessee's a lean for any of those guys. I'm truly not. But Tennessee's in a really, really good position for those guys. Um, so I know I didn't really answer your question, but Nico is very, very close with Kyler Casper. I think Tennessee is really, really pushing hard there for Kyler Casper. They're pushing for Carnell Tate, but I do believe that Casper would be the priority, in my opinion. So Tennessee's in good shape with those guys, but I don't know if I would say that they're a lean by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, that's just my opinion. But prospects who I do believe will be leans, uh, just off the top of my head, Caleb Herring is, is very much in good position with Tennessee. Brandon Schrozier is in good position with Tennessee. Um, I think Nathan Robinson is in good position with Tennessee. Those are the type of prospects I would give a lean towards right now. Again, nothing's done, but that's who I would kind of give uh, a lean towards. All right, we'll come back. We've got a great final Twitter Tuesday question that I said would spark. I said it to him, uh, to Trevor, that it would spark a, uh, a segment prompt, and that's what we're going to do here to end off the show. So one more Twitter Tuesday question, and we'll talk about it when we return. But after months of playing, college basketball has determined that the top teams for the Final Four will determine this year's national championship. That is this upcoming week. BetOnline.net, your number one source for all your betting needs and sports information. From all the latest odds, contests, and player props, you name it. BetOnline.net remains the best spot for all your latest sports developments, including podcasts and reviews from all the leagues this season it's not just basketball either it's not just football bet online is your continued source for all your sports wagering informational needs including live betting and your favorite las vegas casino games so right now head on over to the website or use that mobile device to learn more about the latest trends and all of the action bet online it is where the game starts <laughs> Just a couple minutes to go here on this edition of Locked On Vols. I'm your host, Eric Kane. and welcome back into it. You know the drill, Locked On Vols, your first listen each and every day. All right, concluding a little Twitter Tuesday action. And a couple of days ago, Trevor, listener of the podcast, shout out Trevor, he, he chimed in, and again, this was, I think, over the weekend. Maybe It might have been Friday or Saturday. And he came in with a great prompt. And I said immediately, hey, I'm going to use that as a segment topic because I love it. I actually took it and made it. I don't know how many of you guys listen to the starting lineup uh, every morning, 6 to 9 to 8.30 every morning. We do this segment called Star Bench Cut. I actually implemented this into our Star Bench Cut segment. I liked it so much. So again, shout out Trevor. For Twitter Tuesday, if you were starting a college, how and you could uh, take a current Tennessee Athletics head coach, who would it be? I'd have to go with Tony Vitello because I honestly believe he should be a Major League Baseball coach. I could also see arguments made for Rick Barnes and Kelly Harper, too. Yeah, it's a really, really good one. For the sake of the star bench cut exercise, I replaced Kelly Harper with Josh Heupel because, again, football football moves the needle, football sells. Uh, but Kelly Harper deserves to be in this conversation, too, because she's kind of restarting. I'm not going to say restarting. Um, she is rejuvenating the Lady Ball basketball program, not restarting. Um, rejuvenating that program, taking over, of course, for Holly Warlick, who took over for an impossible job of past summit. And, and I get all that, but, um, lady ball knows the lay of the land, good basketball coach. She's, she's been very successful at a couple of different spots now getting Tennessee back to the sweet 16 for the first time since 2016, despite an injury to your best player. She's been out a month and a half, an injury to your starting, uh, one of your starters before the season started, she didn't even play. And then an injury to uh, Cheyenne Green, your, your sixth player off the bench, who's very critical to the rotation for the Lady Vols. So despite all that, Kelly Harper got him back to the Sweet 16. So I think she did a phenomenal job. Um, Josh Heupel, you know, is, is doing, a, doing a great job of kickstarting this program back up, changing the the overall expectations, the minds. I don't want to say expectations, but the mindset, um, changing the direction, the mantra of the Tennessee football team making it exciting again, making it, uh, you know, um, a team that uh, can go in. You feel like you're in every single game. You feel like you can win every single game. Tennessee's not there yet, but it's under a good direction with Josh Heibel. Rick Barnes, I've said it a million times, you're going to have a chance to win a national championship every single year because he's recruiting so great right now for Tennessee. It'll never recruit the way it is right now. Plus, it's a defensive-minded team first. You saw how Tennessee hung in games with high-powered offenses simply because it had a top-five defense every single year. And it develops Grant, Admiral, uh, Jordan Bowden, Kyle Alexander, uh, John Fulkerson to a certain extent. Now Josiah Jordan James, the latest example. Santiago Vescovi, the latest example. 
you see the development in the program for Tennessee, and you know that those guys are going to get better each and every year. But I'm with you. My vote would be Tony Vitello because he didn't rejuvenate. He restarted a program, literally. It was in the, it was six feet under. I mean, it was. And what Tony Vitello is doing now officially in year five, but he uh, we're not going to count the 2020 season because you started, what, 15-1, and one, maybe 15 to nothing in the non-conference play, and then before the SEC schedule started, COVID wiped it out. So I'm, I'm, you know, really, it says he's been here five years. I'm only saying four and a half, right? Already a trip to Omaha, already hosting a regional play, already ho- hosting super regionals. Um, and, and the way he's done it, just like the Braves in the mid nineties, baby, just, you know, arms, arms, arms. You can always, always win. Just like Rick Barnes in basketball, you play defense that way. You have a chance to win every single game. You recruit that way. You have a chance to win every single game. You load your team up with arms. You're going to have a chance to win every single series for sure. And Tennessee has no shortage of the arms. So my vote would be Tony Vitello, the development, the talent evaluator, getting them on campus, the, the, the uh, again, like I said, the development and the results, the proofs in the pudding. You have won an SEC East championship, quotation marks, for the first time since 1997. You have gone to Omaha for the first time since 2005, I believe. I'll double check my notes, 2005. Um Proofs in the pudding. It's Tony Vitello. So, Trevor, that is a great question. I would start it with Tony Vitello. My, if we're doing start bench cut like we do on the starting lineup, my start would be Tony Vitello. My bench would be Rick Barnes. Culture, culture, culture. This program, probably the best program in terms of culture on campus, and it's not even close. True. It's a little bit easier. Your roster is limited. It's not as big as a baseball roster, certainly not as big as a, uh, a football roster. But the culture that's here on Rocky Top because of Rick Barnes and that basketball program is second to none. And uh, gosh, he is. I, I know this is when you ball games, but I mean, he he's a hell of a man, a human being, right? So it's got to count for something, right? Um, he would be my bench. And then my cut would be, given your examples, um, uh, Trevor, would be Kelly Harper. And that's no slouch to her. It's just I think the other two are just you know that good. Uh, my if if you throw Josh Heupel into this mix, I think he would be my cut as well. No slouch to him. It's just it's going to be a little bit of a longer burn for Tennessee football compared to what baseball is going through right now, and then compared to what the Hall of Fame coach Rick Barnes has already brought to this uh, university the past seven seasons. So uh, my vote would be Tony Vitello. Discuss if you're watching on YouTube, listening on YouTube, go in the comments section. If you were starting a new college or university and you could pick one coach to take with you, who would it be and why? Discuss why would it not be Tony Vitello? Why would it be Tony Vitello? Why would it be Rick Barnes? Whoever it would be, uh, discuss. You guys can also tweet me at underscore Kaner and at Locked On Ball. Shout out Trevor, a great, great segment topic. All right, that will do it here for this edition of Locked On Balls. Tons of Twitter Tuesday. That's what I'm talking about. You send them in, we will discuss them, we'll answer them, and we will have a good time every single Tuesday right here on Locked on Vols. Thanks so much for making Locked on Vols your first listen now. Locked on NFL Draft, Ryan Tracy, Eric Crocker, they bring the NFL Draft to life every single day, evaluating each NFL front office and the top prospects from the college game right after Locked on Vols, which is your first listen every single day. Make Locked on NFL Draft your second listen. Guys, thank you so much. Had a blast. We'll continue to break down Tennessee spring football practice. Pro Day is coming up on Wednesday. Lots to get into right here on Lockdown Balls.